man. We're coming up for you. Well, there's no one here yet, and the floor is completely engulfed. We're on the floor, and we can't breathe. Okay. And it's very, very, very hot. Okay. All I see is smoke. Oh, please. I'm going to die, aren't I? No, 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 no. Say I'm going to die. Ma'am, 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 say your prayers. And we're not going to die. We're going to think positive because you got to help each other get off the floor. I'm going to die. No. Oh, it's so me. hot. I'm burning up. Hello? Osama bin Laden is the world's most wanted terrorist. Many to fight the bin Laden's terrorist organization. Osama bin Laden is punished. Those responsible. Punish. 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 I want justice. And uh, uh, there's an old poster out west, as I recall, that said, wanted, dead or alive. If you go to the FBI website, they've got Osama bin Laden. And if you go to Osama bin Laden's webpage on the FBI most wanted terrorist list, you find that he's been indicted for the 1998 attacks, but not for 9-11. And in fact, a number of journalists called up the FBI and said, well, look, why have you not connected bin Laden to 9-11? And they said, well, I'm afraid we just don't have the evidence. And that's just the beginning. September 11, 2001, I was employed by a company called Eurobrokers, and our offices were on the 84th floor of the South Tower, which was the second building to be hit that day with an airplane. And I was working away at my computer, and at 8.46 in the morning, there was this loud boom. At 8.46 and 40 seconds, American Airlines Flight 11 hits the North Tower of the World Trade Center, causing extensive damage between the 93rd and the 99th floors. from the, the Port Authority came, your attention please. Building two, our building, building two is secure. There is no need to evacuate building two. And two or three minutes later, I started talking with one fellow named Bobby Call. And Bobby told me that he had been down about eight floors, 10 floors, heard the announcement and had come back up. And as he was telling me this, boom, boom, this double explosion and our building shook. At 9.03 a.m., United Airlines Flight 175 hits the South Tower. Everything just exploded in our room. Now, we're on the 84th floor. What I didn't know at the time 
was that the second plane had hit six floors below us on the 78th floor. So we're six floors above impact. I heard this banging on the wall and this faint scream for help inside the 81st floor. I hooked underneath them and I pulled them up. He said that later that I was like Superman. And we came up and over and fell, me, I fell back down on my back. And this stranger landed on top of me and he gave me this big kiss. We got up, dusted ourselves off. Um, and, and I said, come on, let's go home. The two towers shake considerably with the first impact, but they immediately return to their original structural position. Why? Because they were specifically designed to do this in the event of a plane crash. Towers were very uh, solidly built. Uh, it's like a tree. You see, when you bend a tree, you have all these fibers in the tree, but they're interconnected, so when the tree bends, it can, abs it can handle that motion. Nevertheless, 56 minutes after Flight 175 strikes the South Tower, it suddenly collapses in on itself. just come out of, we started to see it, you know, boom, 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 move. And we stared in disbelief as this took about eight or ten seconds for the whole tower just to go straight down and dissolved into its own ash. We started to go in, and all of a sudden there were people jumping from the towers. One jumped down and hit a fireman. At 10.28, the North Tower also collapses. I threw away my oxygen mask to make me lighter. I started running because when I turned around, I saw the tower coming down. Then there was all this dust that got me. When I got home, all my family was waiting for me. And I was lucky to come back to my family. All my friends, they never came back. The official justification for the inexplicable collapse of the Twin Towers was written by the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Between 2002 and 2006, they studied the demolition of the World Trade Center, reaching the conclusion that the collapse of the towers was caused by the combined effects of the impact of the airplanes and the resulting fires started by these impacts. We have been told by the very people who designed and built these towers that they should have resisted the impact of more than one airplane. We have to ask ourselves, did the engineers and architects imagine that airplanes could crash into the towers without any fuel? Perhaps they thought that the airplanes could get there by just blowing in the breeze. Never before or after 9-11 have steel frame towers collapsed due to fire. 
In 2005, there was a fearsome conflagration in Madrid. A skyscraper went up in flames. It was a huge torch that kept burning for 20 hours, 20 consecutive hours. But in the end, the load-bearing structure remained intact. The skyscraper did not fall down. As you can see, the building is enveloped in flames. This skyscraper was not yet complete. It was still under construction. Nevertheless, it remained standing. Something you should note is the white color of the flames. This means that there is a lot of oxygen burning. If you look at the flames coming from the two towers in New York, we can see instead that the flames are dark red and the smoke is black. The fires that were burning in these towers was a dark gray, a heavy, almost black gray smoke coming off. This implies a, an oxygen-starved fire. Nevertheless, 55 minutes later, the whole tower collapses. According to the official NIST version of events, at a certain point, the steel structure of the towers gave way. It no longer had the structural strength that it had at the beginning. And all of this was supposed to be because of the immense heat. And here is something difficult to explain. We know that at some point, certain people managed to walk down from the top of this tower and cross the point where the fire was strongest. Somehow they reached the bottom of the tower. How did they manage to do that? I don't know. I, I, when I looked down there, I didn't see flames. I just sensed that it was the right thing to go and try and test it. We would go as far as we could until we were stopped by flames. And when we came to the 78th floor, the, the last layer was standing, but it was cracked. And there were flames licking up the other side of the wall like this. It wasn't a roaring inferno. I, I sensed that the flames were maybe starved for oxygen right there, you know, in the interior. We kept going, and we got onto the 74th floor when we got down that far. Normal conditions. The lights were on, fresh air coming up from below. So the temperature inside the building was not particularly high, as we can see from the presence of this woman who is standing at the precise point where the plane impacted. In order to verify the way the buildings collapsed and how the heat had affected the steel, NIST commissioned numerous tests, some of which were conducted by a company called Underwriters Labs. And uh, Kevin Ryan, he's the uh, former employee from Underwriters Laboratories who um, challenged the NIST report and he went public with it. And within a week, he was fired from his job. We did test the floor models in August of 2004. And those tests disproved the primary theory behind the collapse of the buildings was, it was called the pancake theory. The floors would collapse upon each other into a stack of pancakes, and then the columns were no longer supported, and the columns would fall apart. Well, the floor models didn't collapse in the tests, and they were, these were in furnaces, you know, testing furnaces, much hotter temperature, longer periods of time. They still didn't collapse. So, yeah, a few months later, the government put out an update on their report, and they stated not only that the floors did not collapse, but they had done tests on the few samples they had saved from the fire zones. And those tests proved that the temperatures were very low. Temperatures were not hot enough to soften, to even soften steel. 
And yet, they're coming out with a summary statement that says that's what actually did happen, that the floors did collapse and, and the steel did soften. So they either downplayed those results or ignored those results, and they ended up putting it all in a computer Thanks to computers, NIST managed to straighten this problem out, and the old pancake theory was replaced by the inward bowing theory. According to the Institute, the heat weakened the floors, which started to curve downwards. The external walls of the towers also curved inwards until they could no longer bear the weight of the structures above, causing the towers to collapse. Their final theory is almost entirely computer-based. And the computer itself is not really accessible. They haven't given it to us to examine. After having investigated it more over the last year and a half, I found that, yes, they did contradict their test results. But additionally, they also did manipulate the test parameters. They doubled one thing. They, they cut something else in half. For example, their story says that aircraft combustibles were at 13 tons in the aircraft cabin. The FAA says it's more like an average of six and a half tons. It's double, so they double it. They double the time that their computer model exposes columns to fire 90 minutes instead of what we know is 45 or 50 minutes in both of the buildings, actually. So they double it. They cut something else in half. So they double it. One of the things that particularly struck me was the incredible speed with which the towers came down. There was something truly inexplicable about the speed of the collapse. If we dropped a weight from a height of around 400 meters, which was the height of the towers, the time it would take to reach the ground, supposing that there was not even any air resistance to slow down the speed of the fall, would take approximately nine seconds. It took about eight or ten seconds for the whole tower just to go straight down. The impact was at about two-thirds of the way up the tower. Even if the section above collapsed suddenly due to the structure giving way, and even considering that the impact of the section above was enormous and therefore in some way weakened the resistance of the structures below, it is clear that, due to the resistance of the undamaged part below, this tower should not have fallen at such a speed. But it fell as if there was nothing below it, whereas there was an enormous structure below, a resistance structure that should have slowed down the speed of the collapse considerably. Here, close to the two towers, there was another large tower, which was hit by the debris from the tower that collapsed. This building is huge. It was a 47-story building. It was never hit by a jet. And yet it came down that same day, but seven hours after the last tower fell, seven hours later. <laughs> is almost free fall speed. The collapse of the North Tower inflicts some damage to Building 7, causing fires to ignite on a few floors. Even the official version admits that fire has a low probability of causing the collapse. But why does total collapse take place? And why does it occur at free fall speed? As I saw the uh, collapse of World Trade Center 7, I realized this was something that needed to be studied and could not be ignored. Building 7 and the Twin Towers share one utterly bewildering similarity, the presence of molten metal found in the debris of all three buildings weeks after the collapse. Is this uh, molten metal that we have now studied at length uh, that came from these buildings and existed then in pools 
underneath the rubble of all three skyscrapers, both towers and Building 7. A metallographic analysis was conducted by a specialized institute that examined the structure of a girder taken from ground zero. When these girders were extracted from under the rubble, it seems as if parts of them had melted. This is totally inexplicable because the temperatures reached by the fires could only have been 800 degrees at the most. To melt a steel girder, you have to reach temperatures of around 1600 degrees. How could this be? At a microscopic level, if you examine the granular structure of the steel, one can detect the presence of an element that should not normally be present, and it is there in substantial quantities. It is sulfur. We're quite sure now where this molten metal came from. It comes from a material called thermate, which is aluminum powder, iron oxide, and sulfur. The temperature is so high that steel melts. It could only melt if the temperature reached over 1,000 degrees in a few seconds. The use of thermite could certainly have caused the fusion apparent in the steel beams. You see, the presence of thermite now in these buildings to bring them down implies that someone had to place the thermite near the steel columns in order to cut through the columns. I have interviewed a, a demolition expert and he said this is what they do. They set explosives. They, they can use radio control to initiate the firing of the explosives. They have to be done in a sequence in order to get the building to come down rapidly and straight down. A controlled demolition. Scientists, we look at different hypotheses, different explanations. But then we have to look at all the data to see which explanation fits the best. You have to incorporate all the picture. Yes, yes, you may take an isolated fact like the plume and say, well, perhaps that was a high air pressure that somehow blew a window out. But that will not account for the molten metal or the sulfidation or the molten pools. When the t South Tower collapsed and blew into my apartment directly across from the World Trade Center, I saved the dust, I gave it to Stephen Jones. The dust that was provided by Mrs. McKinley is very interesting because it's like a snapshot of the residue being produced by the tower during its collapse. It's perfect. Now we look in the dust and we see metal droplets. And when I saw that, I thought, whoa. This is what I expect from thermite because I've done a number of thermite experiments and you get small metal drops being s thrown out in all directions. And, and this is what we see in the dust now, these little metal drops. We also see barium. This is very interesting because barium nitrate and sulfur are part of the military patent on what is known as thermate. This is thermite with sulfur and barium nitrate added to make this material cut more rapidly through steel. Now barium is a very toxic metal, so one would not ordinarily expect this to be present in the large concentrations that we see. Well, the fact that we see it in these and in the dust is uh, a very strong indication to me that uh, the military form of uh, thermite that has been used. The 
turned out that literally dozens of firefighters and emergency medical workers had given testimony that they had heard one, two, three, seven, eight, some said ten explosions going off in the building. Some of the people in the buildings reported that they were banged around and knocked downstairs by explosions. Um, other people testimony, uh, testified to seeing flashes. And many of them said, it looked just like on TV when we see them bring down buildings with explosions. We saw the flashes, we saw the demolition rings, we heard the sounds. I worked there for 20 years and I was a janitor, the person that cleaned all the floors. The building has six up levels of basement. The support companies for the cleaning of the World Trade Center was, were located on Big One. While I was there at 846, all of a sudden we hear boom, an explosion so hard that pushes us up. When I went to verbalize it, uh, like six seconds after, we hear that boom, that impact all the way on the top. So two different events. And at that very moment, when I, when I said, oh my God, a guy comes running into the office and <clears throat> this guy had his hands extended, both arms like this, and his skin was pulled totally from both arms, and it was hanging from the top of the fingertips like it was clothing. And I thought at that time that it was clothing. And when I went to say something, I realized, that I look at his face, I realized that he had missing parts of his face. He had, on that particular day, the only master key. He went up with the master key, unlocking door after door so firemen could get in. And he himself, I think he said, brought out 15 or 20 people. So I started opening the doors of the stairwell so people could escape. Willie was made a hero, and he was at the White House. And we have a picture of that, of George Bush honoring Willie Rodriguez for being a hero. We hear boom, 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 different explosions. And I asked the fire department, he said, what is this explosion? And what they said was, maybe it's the gas tank from the kitchen. No, the kitchens were all electrical. So that didn't make any sense. I heard a loud explosion, an explosion that I had never heard in my whole life, an enormous explosion. My ears were hearing loud explosions at ground level, very mysterious. Explosions that seemed to be at ground level as opposed to high in the air. There's no question in my mind that those buildings, based on the law of physics, could not have collapsed without the assistance of uh, a bomb. No! When I hear another explosion, no! I think it's a bomb. Willie has taken the really 180% turn of events, saying here this that President Bush, who had honored him being a hero, he's now, he's named on this lawsuit as accusing Bush and Cheney and Senior Bush and others of murder. And he's not doing it for any monetary gain because this has just cost us everything now. Willie has was, um, lost his home, lost his job. Right now, he's, um, his goal is to find out the truth. According to the official story of the 11th of September, at 9.37 a.m., American Airlines Flight 77 crashed into the Pentagon. This rare footage shows the scene immediately after the impact, an hour before the entire structure collapsed. As you can see, it is a rather unusual scene one would reasonably expect to see something of this sort. That is to say, pieces of the airplane, suitcases, debris everywhere, just like every other air crash on land. Instead, there is no substantial visual evidence of debris. 
I have been on some accident investigation sites in the Air Force, and I have never come across any accident scene where there's no telltale evidence of the airplane that crashed. Here we have airplane sites, crash sites, that give zero evidence. Where did the airplane go? Did it break up against the wall of the Pentagon? If it had done so, thousands of parts of the plane should have been scattered all over the disaster zone. You know, things like engines and landing gears and brakes and tires are very difficult to destroy. Very difficult, because they're, you know, they're made out of very high-tempered steel, and I don't believe the airplane could be made to go fast enough to pulverize those things. I've never seen that happen before. You look around, there's a 16-foot hole for an airplane that's 100 and some feet wide. According to the official story, the American Airlines Boeing 757 disappeared inside this hole. Can you see it? Five meters. I repeat, five meters in diameter. Let's make some calculations. A Boeing 757 is, including its wingspan, of course, 38 meters wide. And including the rudder or the tail fin, it is 13 and a half meters high. To get all of this huge aircraft into a hole five meters wide seems rather implausible to me. In this picture, we can see a row of windows on this side and another row on that side. They should have been smashed and destroyed by the wings, and instead they're intact. These windows aren't even broken. For years, the military refused to answer the questions of an increasing number of people who rejected the official version. When the French journalist Thierry Maison published the book The Incredible Lie, utterly surreal explanations were put forward to shut the detractors up. One of these maintained that the airplane had been vaporized by the speed and the force of the crash. One very strange thing that doesn't make sense is the disappearance of various components of this Boeing. For example, the two engines. And what about the plane's wings? Where did they go? Had they been gasified? Instead, we are told the fuselage remained intact, and it smashed through the whole outer wall of the Pentagon and emerged through the other side, destroying a number of columns. The most solid part of the airplane is, without any doubt, the engines. In fact, these engines are made of a titanium steel alloy. It is so tough that it doesn't even melt at 3,000 degrees centigrade. Well now, in this wall we should be able to see, if nothing else, the holes made by the two engines that smashed into it. No, there is no sign of them. The two holes that we'd expect to see are not there. And there's no indication of, of the wings hitting anything at the Pentagon, like you had at the North Tower. You can see the outline of the aircraft, the 25 degree bank angle. You can clearly see the outline of the number one engine, fuselage of number two engine. It's a 25 degree bank. The wing dihedral is up in flight. And you can clearly see the outline of that airplane. But you can't find anything like that on the Pentagon. You can't find anything like that on the Pentagon. These inconsistencies have created more and more difficulties for the proponents of the official version. So, while the military kept silent during this debacle, various photos of airplane debris found on the external lawns and along the supposed route of the airplane within the building started appearing in newspapers and on the web. Very well, they admitted there was no gasification, but another theory was immediately put forward. It suggested that in order to enter a hole five meters wide, at a certain moment, the airplane somehow closed up its wings, just as dragonflies do. The plane entered the hole. Oh, look. There they are. The engine and the other pieces of the plane were found there. One of my experiences in the Army was 
being in charge of the Army's imagery interpretation for scientific and technical intelligence during the Cold War. I measured pieces of Soviet equipment from photographs. It was my job. I look at the hole in the Pentagon, and I look at the size of an airplane that was supposed to have hit the Pentagon. The plane does not fit in that hole. So what did hit the Pentagon? What hit it? Where is it? What hit what it? Where is it? it? What's going on? General Arnold, that very morning, immediately after that alleged impact, ordered one of his fighter pilots to fly over and down to the Pentagon to look and see what he saw and to report back to General Larry Arnold himself. At that time, Major General Larry Arnold was commander of aviation at NORAD, North American Aerospace Defense Command, in charge of protecting the United States and Canada. His fighter pilot reported back to him that there was no evidence, zero evidence, of an impact of a plane at the Pentagon. Since the Pentagon possessed 86 separate and complete video recordings of the incident, why didn't they show some whole portions of them to those people who had doubts about it? The FBI was immediately at the scene and took the surveillance tapes and confiscated 86 videotapes, both in the Pentagon, the Pentagon parking lot, in the gas station, across the freeway from the Pentagon in a nearby hotel, uh, in all kinds of buildings that had their cameras trained in that general area. For a long time, the military authorities refused to release the footage of Flight 77's impact. But in 2006, the United States Department of Defense was forced to yield to freedom of information requests, and it released four video sequences. The video evidence from the Pentagon Sitgo gas station and the nearby Sheraton Hotel are of no use. But two samples of video footage captured from the Pentagon's parking lot have been offered to the world as definitive proof of Flight 77's impact with the Pentagon. They're almost identical. Jet engines don't uh, emit white smoke. You have some white smoke will come out of the, the aft end of whatever kind of vehicle. Quite frankly, there's not enough in those photographs to tell exactly what it was, but you can tell what it wasn't and it wasn't, didn't have the size as compared, if it was a real 757-200, it would be much bigger than the vehicle we see, do see in the picture. With the best will in the world, can you see an airplane here? The Pentagon tells us you cannot see the airplane because unfortunately it passed between one frame and the next. The one frame and the next. So where is the aeroplane? According to FBI agent Jacqueline Maguire, as you can see in this affidavit, only one camera took pictures of the scene, and those are the frames that we've already seen. The story of how this airplane is supposed to have got there is absolutely absurd. One cannot imagine how, in order to get down to the height of the Pentagon Wall, it was able to make a 270-degree turn at a speed of approximately 800 kilometers per hour. That is a really difficult maneuver, and what I will say to you is that an experienced pilot with thousands of hours 
probably would have to take between 10 and 20 attempts. Skill, thousands of hour pilots, probably 10 or 20 times before they would be able to pull off that maneuver. 757 is not designed to do that. 757 is designed to be basically a cruise ship in the sky. It's not acrobatic. So you just can't do that with one of those big airplanes. The air traffic controllers at the Dulles Approach Control, when they saw this target come in and make this turn, they said, oh, that's a fighter. Because military fighters can do that, okay? And military fighters with autopilots and being flown remote, they have the structural cap capability they have designed to be able to be that acrobatic. The absurdity of absurdities. There is also the height at which this aeroplane was flying to be explained. It is supposed to have followed the lie of the land at six meters from the ground for one kilometer, managing also to jump over a hill. Then it went over a roadway, and it finally got there without making any other turns because by now there was no more space. have the airplane, the story has the uh, Flight 77 was going 530 miles an hour, 460 knots, and it can't go that fast on level flight that down that low. If you're up high, the true airspeed can go up and it can go that fast, but not down low. It's, the air is too dense. I challenge any pilot, any pilot anywhere, give him a Boeing 757, tell him to do 400 knots 20 feet above the ground for half a mile. Can't do. Can't do. It's, aerodynamic. it's aerodynamically impossible. And so the story of how the airplane hit the Pentagon uh, is just doesn't make any sense at all. After Honey Hanjo, the plane's pilot had been identified, his flight instructor declared that his student was not even able to fly a small, single-engine aeroplane. <laughs> These guys didn't have the experience fly, to make that kind of maneuver, uh, even if the airplane could fly that. The man could not fly at all. There's no way you could possibly come out of a 172 and fly a jet that you've never flown before. That's like showing me how to carve up a Christmas turkey and then say, go make a heart transplant. Even if we suppose that such an incompetent pilot had the opportunity to fly a Boeing 757, we still have to ask ourselves how he managed to violate the most heavily protected airspace in the world. No untracked aircraft get near the Pentagon and in and near the White House. It just doesn't happen. In Washington, D.C., we have one of the most restricted airspaces in the world. It's called P-56. It has a separate radar tracking system and a separate military response system. P-56 is that uh, restricted airspace that is around the Pentagon and the White House, and it, it is a highly, highly, highly sensitive area. There are supposed to be no unknown aircraft that can go through there. That has an air defense identification zone in a 50-mile radius around D.C., and then it has a protected zone 17 miles around the Washington Monument and an inner protected zone three miles around the Capitol. That space is essentially unbreachable. It has to be because of the importance of the buildings there. It's like, it's like an aviation no man's land. Nobody goes in there, nobody. They have F-16 and F-18 jets at Andrews Air Force Base about 10 miles south of DC. They also have the 113th National Guard Air Wing at Anacostia Naval Air Station. Uh, that can send scrambler jets up in a very short period of time. Both are in place that day. Neither one responds at all until after the Pentagon is hit. In addition to that, the Pentagon has its own defenses. If a plane, any kind of a plane, was coming in towards the Pentagon, why didn't the uh, anti-aircraft missiles 
batteries that are there, why didn't they fire to protect the building? This is, after all, the most heavily protected building on the planet. That craft had to have been a military craft because only the military craft put out a signal. It's called an Identify Friend or Foe IFF device. And only the military craft would be allowed to approach the building. The two radar systems that the military radars, defensive radar systems read are a civilian transponder and a military transponder. Military transponder is called IFF. Civilian aircraft do not have an IFF transponder. They are not given that take capability, okay? So if there was a 757, American 757, that went into the Pentagon, for example, um, and it shut off its transponder, it didn't have a military IFF transponder on it. So it was a primary target. It's a primary target going into that airspace. Should have been shot down. What I'm describing to you is a breakdown in standard operating procedure by FAA, NORAD, P-56, and the Pentagon, all on the same day, in the middle of, after 9.05, what was known nationally to be a terrorist attack. And it makes no sense. Nobody goes in there. This is, after all, the most heavily protected building on the planet. It just doesn't make any sense at all. The Pentagon symbolizes our military power in the world. And they had hit it. And uh, to this day, nobody knows what they hit it with, whether it was an airplane or whether it was a missile. And our government will never tell us. So we just kept wait for the French to explain it. <laughs> what hit it? What's going on? There is nobody anywhere at any point in this entire investigation that has said that is positively American 77. They suppose it. They presume it, they assume it, they say this is what we think it is. The controller, Daniel O'Brien, who saw the unidentified blip coming in from the west at a high rate of speed, had no way of knowing what it was because the primary was a primary return only, the secondary radar, the transponder was turned off. In order to identify a primary radar target, you have to have two-way communications between the pilot and the air traffic controller, and the pilot has to report over a certain geographical location, or you have to be able to tell the pilot in the airplane to make a series of turns, and then the radar con controller can look at all of the primary targets on his or her tra radar scope and say, there's an aircraft, or there's a target that just executed the turns I told. Now I can positively identify the aircraft. That never occurred. It's huge. Now, if Flight 77 really did go off of the radar screen for 36 minutes, according to the her testimony, then the airplane was no longer flying, or it was in a, it was low enough that it was out of radar coverage. One of the two. So, was the airplane landed at some place, some remote field? Then it does make sense that. They lost the airplane for 36 minutes. But other than that, there's very little explanation for that. In the light of what we've seen and heard, it seems that the official version of 9-11 is not sufficient. We want the facts to be explained to us, and above all, we want them to be properly investigated. Basically, we want someone to finally tell us the truth. The United States government spends $892 billion per year to defend its citizens and its territory. It is the best protected country in the world, as President Bush has said. Nevertheless, on the 11th of September, the heart of America was attacked from the sky and 3,000 helpless American citizens were killed in their own cities. If I had been sitting on that committee, the Congressional Committee examining 9-11, the one question that they could not get the Air Force to answer correctly in NORAD was why the fighter planes did not go up automatically when the first planes were found to be hijacked. 
any time an airliner goes off course or loses radio communication or loses its transponder signal, any time any one of those three things happen, the aircraft is supposed to be intercepted. On 9-11, all three of those things happened. And still, there was no intercept. Those planes flew around for from 20 minutes to an hour and a half without ever being intercepted. We have direct contacts with our air defense colleagues by means of direct connections that are controlled by this touchscreen apparatus. By pressing just one key here, the call is sent, to which the operator of the defense, in this case, answers directly. In the time it takes to answer the telephone call, around two to three seconds, the information can be already exchanged. So why weren't the full hijacked planes intercepted and shot down? Military jets travel much faster than passenger aircraft. It would have been easy for them to catch up the jet planes before they crashed. This airplane can reach a maximum speed of Mach 2.05. This means it exceeds twice the sound barrier. This is approximately 2,400 kilometers per hour. In the northeast of the United States, there are as many as 16 Air Force bases. Why weren't the Boeing jets intercepted? The official story argues that air defense was informed too late. One of the biggest lies is, is that the FAA guys were incompetent. When we lose an airplane, we take action. We do not sit, we do not delay, we do not, we go to protocol. Boom, 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 boom. When the air traffic controllers first saw, saw American 11 start to lose its radio, lose its transponder, go off course, and all of these bad things that are going on, they did not take a coffee break. 67 times in, the, in that year, 2001 up till September, there had been air emergencies. Uh, they can get a plane up in from six to ten minutes uh, and scramble it in 67 times that year in air emergencies but there was not an instance where an air emergency went ignored for long periods of time until 9-11. A lot of people down the road say well the president had to give authority to shoot aircraft down and stuff like that. That is not true. Uh, an interceptor pilot has the responsibility and the authority on his or her own to shoot down an airplane if they think uh, the situation calls for it and this is how it would be. You don't have to wait for a military command. You don't have to wait for orders of any kind. That's not an option. That's the law. It's inherent in being a fighter pilot. You know that's what you have to do unless somebody has told you to stand down. Uh, before 1970, we had one form of scrambling aircraft, and it was immediate, bang, bang, bang. Then in the 1970s, we had some hijackings come into our civil uh, airspace, and that wasn't a quick response. What we did in that is we didn't want the hijackers to know that we were there. So we, we didn't rush the fighters off the ground, and we kind of snuck them up behind the aircraft. So we put a second protocol in, and the reason that the hijacking protocol is slow is because you had to get Pentagon approval before you could release your fighters. Those two type of protocols lasted until June 1st, 2001, three months before 9-11. In June of 2001, Rumsfeld and the Pentagon and the military changed the procedures and instead of having two protocols, one fast, one slow, they went to one protocol, slow. If we had reacted to the in-flight emergency, immediately the fighters would have been up and on the way and those aircraft would never ever have reached their targets. But when the center controllers came to notifying the military, 
okay? Because they had only one protocol to work with, that protocol went through the Pentagon. Guess what? Guess who didn't answer the phone? Sorry, it was the Pentagon. Here's an analogy that I can give that would help out the common person here. What Rumsfeld did is the fire call comes into the fire station, but before the fire truck gets a chance to leave, it has to call the mayor of the city to get approval for that departure. And what if the mayor is out for breakfast or he's sleeping late and he doesn't answer the phone? Look carefully at this footage shot just a few minutes after the attack on the Pentagon. Notice the man that is helping to carry a casualty. It is the Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld. What is he doing here when, as head of the defense of the whole nation, and whilst the United States is still under attack, he is helping tend to the wounded? Why is he not at his command post? The phone calls went to the Pentagon. It went through the military. And the military was sitting there saying, oh, man, don't answer, you know, don't answer that phone, whatever it might be. <laughs> now, how would you like your fire department to sit there and say, well, I'm sorry, we can't come and put your house out and save your lives because the mayor didn't say so. And on 9-12, they changed the protocols again back to the first protocol, which was the fast scrambles, and that's what it is today. So the way that Rumsfeld's Pentagon managed this whole thing is they, they switched gears, okay? They switched out of having two fast and slow into slow, okay? And then they said, oh, we're bad, 9-12, let's go fast again. When the United States was attacked without warning at Pearl Harbor, after eight inquiries, General Walter Short, commander of the Army for the Defense of Hawaii, and Admiral Husband Kimmel, commander-in-chief of the Pacific Fleet, were both charged with negligence and summarily dismissed. But after the 9-11 catastrophe, nobody, neither the Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld, nor the Head of Civil Aviation, nor that of Air Defense, was either punished or removed from office. On September 10th, Brigadier General W. Montague Winfield asked junior officer Captain Charles Lydig to temporarily replace him as Director of Operations at the Pentagon Command Center from 8.30 a.m. on September 11th. Later that day, after Flight 93 was reported crashed, Winfield resumed control. Captain Leidig had only just completed a course qualifying him to run the command center. On September the 11th, Brigadier General David F. Worley Jr. was commander of the Andrews Air Force Base, the nearest one to the Pentagon. On September the 11th, Richard B. Myers, Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, in the absence of Chairman Shelton, was the temporary head of all U.S. Armed Forces. On the 14th of September, after only three days of investigations, the FBI announces it knows everything about the hijackers of the flights. We have, in the last 24 hours, taken the manifests and used those as an, evident, as an evidentiary base and have talked to many of the families of the victims and have successfully, I believe, identified many of the hijackers on each of the four flights that went down. Let's look at the Lockerbie case. It took two years to bring indictments in that case. Two years. In this case, in only three days, the FBI provided the names of all the hijackers without providing any evidence that they were actually on the flights. On the 12th of September, the Attorney General of the United States, Mr. Ashcroft, declares to the whole world that the passport of one of the hijackers had been found a few blocks away from the ruins of Ground Zero. 
ci dicono che tutto ciò che si trovava even though they had said that everything inside the towers had been burnt up or had been reduced to a fine dust so the steel was molten but paper survived Who were these hijackers? The official story states that 15 out of the 19 came from Saudi Arabia. That they were trained in Afghanistan and that they were Islamic fundamentalists, fanatical Muslims. Al-Qaeda is supposed to be a Salafist network, you know, and Salafism is a very, very Puritan strain of Islam that suggests that we need to follow very closely to the letter the activities of the Prophet Muhammad. So were these people Islamic fundamentally? The evidence would suggest no. Muhammad Asa was basically not an Islamic fundamentalist. They were always drinking, always drinking. The identikits of the hijackers supplied by the FBI are truly bizarre. Each identikit corresponds to a number of persons. These persons are very different. They have different attitudes and different biographies. They live in different places, sometimes at the same moment. When you speak of Mohammed Atta, what Mohammed Atta? Is it the Mohammed Atta who was in Hamburg, Germany, being run by German intelligence? Is it that Mohammed Atta? Is it the Mohammed Atta who appears in Venice, Florida, which is a major locus for the National Security Agency, who's supposedly training at a little flight school for a little single and dual engine Cessna aircraft, and who's rooming with a man named Charlie Voss, who was a CIA pilot who ran guns into Nicaragua and cocaine out for the Central Intelligence Agency? Is it that Mohammed Atta? Is it the Mohammed Atta who spoke to his father on the 12th of September, as Newsweek reported, in an interview with his father in Cairo? Is it that Mohammed Atta? Is it the Mohammed Atta who appears in a bar called Shukum's Bar in Hollywood, Florida, doing lines of cocaine and drunk on Stolichnaya vodka? and who when asked to pay his bill, says, I work for United States Airlines. You think I can't pay my bill? And then he says, fuck God. This is not the behavior of an Islamic fanatic who is about to commit a suicide martyrdom operation. Prima che l'atta che risiede ad Hamburgo in Germania, According to the official version, before Atta, who lived in Hamburg, Germany, moved to the United States, his American namesake was visiting an office of the Department of Agriculture, where he spoke to an employee to request a loan of $650,000. With this loan, he wanted to rent a small aeroplane and attach a large tank of chemicals to it. Upon the refusal of the woman to give him the loan, he began to threaten her, saying he would cut her throat. Then he told her he was an American Airlines pilot. He threw a bundle of banknotes onto the desk and asked for information about the security systems of the Twin Towers. He even tried to buy a poster of the Pentagon that was on the wall of the office and then he finally went away. Well now, 
Is this the typical behavior of a member of a secret sleeper cell? Isn't it more like the behavior of someone who is trying to be remembered? This is not the behavior of an Islamic fanatic who is about to commit a suicide Secondo la versione ufficiale, the official version states that Alomari and Atta leave Florida heading for Boston. This is according to plan, since that is where the two aeroplanes due to be hijacked will depart. But they don't stop when they get to Boston, they continue to Maine. It is the afternoon of September the 10th. The next day will be the most important day in the two men's lives, a day on which they cannot make any mistakes. But what do they do? They go on a trip to Portland. They spend the night there and they attract attention to themselves with their noisy revelry. They also pay with credit cards in their names. They do everything they can to leave traces of their presence there. Next morning at 6 a.m., they fly from Maine to Boston. The plane that they are going to hijack takes off only half an hour after their flight lands. This is a very tight time window, potentially putting the whole plan in jeopardy. The circumstances surrounding the departure from Portland to Boston is very important both in terms of the investigation and in shaping public opinion. It is there that the airport CCTV cameras record the video in which we see the faces of Atta and Alomari. This video has been shown hundreds of times on television as evidence of the two terrorists boarding the aeroplane they are about to hijack. It's not true. That video shows them embarking at Portland. There is no evidence of the presence of these hijackers. It is simply something that the FBI tells us, without any proof. There is no proof. There is no way to prove the presence of any one of these patsies, these scapegoats on the planes. None at all. On September the 16th, one of the alleged hijackers of Flight 11, Abdel Aziz Al Amari, went to the Jeddah consulate to protest his innocence to U.S. officers. Al Omari, a pilot from Saudi Airlines, receives an official apology from the American officers in Riyadh. Then, on the 22nd of September, Walid al Shahiri announces he is still alive. He, too, is supposed to have hijacked Flight 11. From his house in Casablanca, Morocco, the impertinent al Shahiri declares his innocence. The following day, the 23rd of September, the Daily Telegraph publishes the protestations of innocence of Saeed al-Ghamdi and Ahmed al-Nami, both of them still alive and well, and pilots for Saudi Arabian Airlines. On the 27th of September, CBS tracks down Salem Al-Hazbi. According to the FBI, he was dead after Flight 77 crashed into the Pentagon. But curiously, he persists in hanging around alive in Saudi Arabia, where he works in an oil refinery. Have the names of Al Omari, Al Shahiri, Al Gamdi, Al Nami, and Al Hazbi been deleted from the list of the hijackers with many apologies? No. Six years later, these 19 people are accused as being the sole perpetrators of the terror attack. establish the identity of the perpetrators and you just have a serious problem in your criminal inquiry. And raising this question is not about raising conspiracy theory. 
it's really just about criticizing the absolutely ridiculous nature of the criminal inquiry and the fact that they have no idea who carried out these attacks. Then the fundamental question in a criminal inquiry is who did it? They have this evil organization. They have the leader of this evil organization, Bin Laden. They have a secret network in the caves of Afghanistan. It could be the screenplay of a James Bond movie. The first Bin Laden videotape that was leaked and that was used by the media to suggest that Osama Bin Laden has claimed responsibility, this was a very problematic videotape. There was an analysis that found that it was completely fraudulent. There were a number of issues. Um, there were basic issues such as, for example, Osama Bin Laden was wearing a gold ring. Now, in Islamic fiqh, Islamic law, a man is not allowed to wear gold. So why is the head of the, one of the most militant Salafist movements wearing a gold ring? It doesn't make sense. The video in question that was found in Afghanistan in very doubtful circumstances by American soldiers in a house that was supposed to have been abandoned by Al-Qaeda has been questioned for various reasons. For example, a German TV network gave an alternative translation. It is completely different from the one given by the American investigators. They are not apparently claiming a role in the 11th of September attacks, but they are simply talking about what happened on September the 11th. Many of the other videos of Osama bin Laden have in fact a person speaking and an audio track that does not correspond, or that corresponds very little, to what his lips are actually saying. People often ask me, how can you doubt the official version if Osama bin Laden himself appeared several times on television to say, I did it? So I will tell you a little story. However, I can only tell you this story as I am unable to show you anything. We cannot show the images we do have because the owners of this material refuse permission for you to see them. In the summer of 2005, the Commission of the European Parliament for Security and Defense, of which I am a member, was invited to a special screening created by the Washington Center for Strategic Studies. We were asked to watch a film which depicted what would happen in Europe if Brussels was hit by a nuclear bomb. 50,000 deaths, 100,000 injured, the reactions of various European governments. Suddenly, footage of Osama bin Laden claiming responsibility for a nuclear attack on NATO headquarters comes on screen. All members of the parliament, myself included, were rendered speechless. American experts from the Center for Strategic Studies were on hand to explain the action on screen. Then a parliamentarian finally said, Today, we were shown a convincing demonstration of how Osama bin Laden's image can be completely manipulated. All the Osamas we have seen over the years may never have existed just as a nuclear attack on NATO headquarters in Brussels has never taken place. Now they're denying us use of these images. No matter, we will go on without them. But people, have a look yourselves. This is Anna Osama bin Laden from the 7th of September of 2007. Compare him with the other Osamas we have seen in the last few years. Do you believe it is possible that he is getting younger over time? Do you believe it is possible that his beard is darker than before? Do you believe it possible that his nose has grown? We don't need analysis. A child can understand that they are two different people, but these people are being introduced to us as if they were the same person. And this story has been told to us now for over six years. Did Bin Laden organize the attacks of September the 11th? And if so, did he do it alone or with someone else? At this point, we must explain the origins of Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda is founded 
Bin Laden founded al-Qaeda in 1989 at the end of the war between the Soviet Union and Muslim guerrillas in Afghanistan. It was after that war and not before that war. So who or what were all those Muslim guerrillas supposed to fight? What did al-Qaeda mean at that time? And this is very interesting. We'd have to go to Robin Cook, the late foreign secretary. In the Guardian article, he confirmed that al-Qaeda was a term that was invented by the CIA. And it had been invented to designate a database, a database of Mujahideen that were recruited and trained by the CIA. And he's right, because the Arabic word for database, you just have to add this word. It's Al-Qaeda Ma'lumat. Al-Qaeda means the base, and Ma'lumat means data. Together it means database. Al-Qaeda is fake. Al-Qaeda is not an organization. Al-Qaeda is only label. There is no organization like Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda is, uh, is a list of participants in the Afghanistan war of the 80s. Al-Qaeda is nothing. It is only a, a, a puppet uh, blow, uh, blown up by the Western propaganda to, to show the public uh, the, the big evil. I was chief of the visa section at the American Consulate General in Jeddah between September 1987 and March 1989. Uh, during the, my period there, I was involved in what turned out to be a Visas for Terrorists program with people coming to the consulate uh, recruited by the Central Intelligence Agency and its asset Osama bin Laden and sent to America either for instruction in how to be good terrorists uh, or for rewards or for debriefings on what they've been doing in, in Afghanistan. I assume it was simply on how to blow things up, shoot things down and overthrow governments. After the Cold War, their connections with Al-Qaeda proliferated, multiplied. Al-Qaeda is being controlled in various ways, directly and indirectly. <laughs> Systematically, Al-Qaeda has been used in various theories of conflict. So from 1992 to 95, you look at the Bosnian conflict. I believe that the American government was working with various Arab and Muslim organizations, whether it was Al-Qaeda or whether it was uh, people that were, became Al-Qaeda, uh, to be trained, to be armed, and to be sent to the Balkans to overthrow Slobodan Milosevic and anybody allied with him. That kind of policy continued in the Balkans all the way up to post-2001. American secret services, who only delivered weapons during the war, after the war also engaged the jobless Mujahideen on their own payroll. That is uh, a proven fact. Uh, there are a lot of testimonies of Mujahideen um, before German courts. Uh, they were hired by subcontractors of the Pentagon, namely uh, the private contractor MPRI, Military Professional Resources Incorporated. MPRI is, uh, is formally private, but in fact it's kind of uh, secret device of uh, the U.S. Army. They have more four stars general under contract than the Pentagon itself. If the Pentagon wants to do some dirty job and thinks uh, they cannot get the money and they cannot get the approval of the U.S. Congress, they give the job to this private company. At the beginning of summer 1999, Emperor I uh, brought this Bosnian Mujahideen back to the Balkans, especially to, into Kosovo, uh, to help uh, the Kosovo uh, terrorist army KLA. They engaged them, they paid them uh, monthly. A lot of um, 
um, Bosnian Mujahideen were involved in the big terrorist attacks of the last five years. So, uh, speaking about 9-11, five of seven Arabs in the center of the 9-11 plot were former Mujahideen fighters in Bosnia. Five of seven. Nobody speaks about it. What is required for you to get a visa approved to enter the United States? The type of information you have to supply is extremely detailed. But a high-ranking official in the U.S. consulate of Jeddah, Michael Springman, revealed the fact that in that office, many CIA agents were working undercover and that the office was issuing too many visas far too easily to some very suspicious people. Yeah, I was told by a really good contact a businessman outside the American consulate that if I had sent one word to the State Department inspection team investigating what was going on in the consulate, I would be fired summarily. Well, that office in Jeddah issued many of the 15 visas that were used by the hijackers to enter the United States. None of the 15 applications conformed to U.S. visa regulations. For example, under the heading destination, many of them wrote hotel, New York or California, and in one case, just no. And so, it was common practice to help the terrorists of Al-Qaeda to enter the United States. They came to be trained, and this went on for years and years. The same thing happened with the hijackers of September the 11th. The terrorists, six of the terrorists, including Mohammed Atta, trained at U.S. military facilities. Okay? Mohammed Atta went to International Officer School at Maxwell Air Force, Air Force Base. Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama, Brooks Air Force Base in Texas. Their contact address, the Pensacola Naval Station in Florida. The Defense Language Institute of the Defense Intelligence Agency in Monterey, California. The hands of intelligence are all over these people. So, to sum up, the main hijackers trained and fought in ex-Yugoslavia where they were paid by a company of mercenaries that was connected to the Pentagon. Thanks to the CIA, they got entry visas to the United States. Once they were in America, they did everything they could to be recognized and to attract attention to themselves since they were sure of their impunity. They trained in American military bases and went to flight schools, although they didn't learn to fly. All the testimony about these lessons indicate that these men were completely incapable of maneuvering even small aeroplanes. For example, Mohammed Atta hired an aeroplane from a flight school, but he was not even able to take off. So he left it there on the runway and went away. Regarding two other pilots, their instructor, Rick Grazza, said to investigators in the press that he could not understand how these two could have maneuvered an aeroplane. His exact words were that it was like dumb and dumber in a plane. Two FBI agents, Colleen Rowley in Minneapolis in the state of Minnesota, and another who was in Phoenix in Arizona, sent messages to the FBI's headquarters in Washington, saying, more or less, watch out, there are many Arabs here who have enrolled in flight schools. The first person in the flight school that called the FBI took a big risk, because at the time, what he was doing was reporting about a customer, a paying customer. And those flight schools depended upon, to a certain extent, foreign pilots. And so now he's reporting about a, a paying customers. I mean, all this person is very suspicious. A list of facts that pointed to Musawi being a terrorist. He wanted to learn to fly but not take off and land. 
I have never seen such a, um, a, a unusual person seeking flight instruction. Colleen Rowley, Colleen Rowley immediately informed her superiors in Washington. But nothing happened. Their investigations were obstructed. There were uh, no warning signs that I'm aware of that would indicate this type of operation in the country. I wrote a memo in May of 2002, a 12, 13 page memo, is the Joint Intelligence Committee uh, report. And both of those were, um, I hope, you know, I, basically what, what I, my memo did was expose that this was not true, that 9-11 could not have been uh, prevented. The FBI's acting director, a guy by the name of Picard, during the summer of 9-11, he attempted to brief Attorney General Ashcroft about terrorism a couple of times. And he, he, the first time, Ashcroft showed little interest in terrorism. In fact, Ashcroft ended up ranking terrorism as his lowest priority in August of 2001. At one point, Picard was told by Ashcroft, I don't want to hear any more about terrorism. After September 11, 2001, when I heard about the, uh, the planes crashing into the World Trade Towers and into the Pentagon, uh, I said, geez, this was the same, these were the same people, according to the Los Angeles Times, who had gotten their visas from the American Consul General at Jeddah. I called the Federal Bureau of Investigation and tell them, essentially, uh, this, the basics of the visas for terrorist program. I did this, I called, and I called, and I called. I was passed from one office of the FBI to another and ended up at the Washington field office. And someone there said, we'll get back to you. Well, six years later, I'm still waiting. We received uh, these uh audio tapes that uh, were obtained three months before uh, September 11, 2001 from a different field office, Iranian informant who'd been on FBI's payroll for 10 years since about 1991-1992 in April 2001. And in April 2001, this informant told the FBI that on a separate issue, he had obtained information about Al-Qaeda bin Laden issuing an attack in the United States that would involve five major cities and it will involve airplanes and that the attack was going to take place within the next few months. They took the information, they found it important, they filled out forms, they came back to the headquarter and then they filed it, they gave it to the superiors, right? Nothing happened. Two months later, they met with the same informant again. And the informant asked, he said, did you do something with that information I gave you because it came from really reliable sources? And the agent said, yes, we gave it to our superiors. Well, nothing happened. Nobody followed up on this. They discovered Ramzi Yusuf's computer with the Bojinka plane in 1996 in the Philippines. It talked about taking hijacked planes and running them into the Pentagon, the White House, the Capitol, the CIA headquarters, and the Twin Towers. The Pentagon staged an exercise a year before, in October of 2000, at the site with the Arlington County Fire Department uh, to simulate a plane running into the Pentagon and how the fire responders would get there and what they would do. So this was not outside the box or, you know, out in the blue. They not only expected it, they prepared for it. One of the most frequent declarations made by the Bush administration was that these attacks took us by surprise. I don't think anybody could have predicted that they would try to use an airplane as a missile, a hijacked airplane as a missile. I don't think the prior government that could envision flying airplanes in the buildings on such a massive scale. Secondo USA Today, 
1999. According to USA Today, in 1999, the American Air Force conducted special exercises four times per year in which the hijacking of civil aeroplanes by terrorists was simulated. The selected targets were the Twin Towers and the Pentagon. I don't think anybody could have predicted. I don't think the prior government that could envision flying airplanes in the buildings. Could have predicted. predicted. I don't think the prior government that could envision flying airplanes in the buildings. On the 11th of September 2002, the New York Times wrote, one year later, the public knows less about the circumstances of 2,801 deaths at the foot of Manhattan in broad daylight than people in 1912 knew within weeks about the Titanic. Five years after that article, what happened that day is still a mystery. My name is Bob McElvain. I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, I lost my son Bobby, who's age 26, on September 11, 2001. He had just gotten a job at Merrill Lynch. <laughs> Already. <laughs> it's, it always hits you blind. <laughs> and, uh, don't worry, I'll get over it. But I mean, any time you just mention that day, it's, it's, it's like the pain just comes shooting up. And of course, when you keep doing this, it's just, you know you think it gets better, but it just never gets better. The conclusions that the 9/11 Commission came to have been very disappointing. A lot of evidence has been ignored. Many witnesses were not called to testify. The final report glosses over a great many key issues. A few days before 9/11, Mohammed Atta received a huge sum of money. Uh, about uh, $100,000 money which was delivered by a Pakistani Secret Service officer. And the big scandal is that the 9-11 Commission of the US Congress never um, interrogated this man and never tried to um, bring light into the story of this 100000 While everybody was doing testimony televised to the whole nation, mine was behind closed door. Now, why would they want that behind closed door? That didn't make any sense. Anyway, I told them exactly the same argument that we have here, that we heard explosions, that uh, people were burned, the prior the building uh, getting hit by the plane, that these people were alive, and they were available to be uh, uh, interrogated. And uh, wow, what a surprise. The final report comes out. They didn't even mention my name is, doesn't appear anywhere. They didn't call not even once any of the witnesses that we gave them. So you have 17 uh, 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 firefighters, you have 22 survivors, and they didn't call not even one of them. Specifically me as a parent, I have an obligation to find out who murdered my son. The commission gave me nothing. 9-11 commission was not an investigation. Remember, the entire bin Laden family was on one, one of the planes later. They'd been collected from all over the United States, and they were whisked out of the country with the speed of light while the Pentagon was still burning. So they asked Mueller, who authorized these people to leave the country? Well, someone in the State Department. Well, can you tell us who? He said, well, I don't recall. I don't recall. Another instance, General Myers, this is later on in the commission. They asked about Musawi. Do you recall getting any information concerning Musawi? His answer was, I don't recall. I don't, I don't recall. recall. I don't recall. Ashcroft, Attorney General. Picard was the FBI head during the summer. He had testified that they had all these warnings 
71 different warnings about something happening this summer. And Ashcroft sat there and lied. So I didn't know these things. I didn't know these warnings. We were paying attention to terrorism. No warning signs that I'm aware of. Anybody and I don't think the prior government predicted. could envision flying airplanes in the buildings. These people lied, and our government protected them. It was obvious they were lying. These people, the people who were testifying, should have gone. Mueller should be in jail. Ashcroft should be in jail. Condoleezza Lay should be in jail. I don't think, I don't think anybody no signs could have, have predicted that they were 20 in the airplanes and the police. Punish. And punish those responsible. They have this evil organization. They have the leader, Bin Laden. Punish, dead or alive. They have a secret network in the caves of Afghanistan. Tonight, the United States of America makes the following demands on the Taliban. Deliver to United States authorities all the leaders of Al-Qaeda who hide in your land. Give the United States full access to terrorist training camps so we can make sure they are no longer operating. These demands are not open to negotiation or discussion. Obviously, they will never catch Bin Laden, because then everybody will think the war on terror is over. It's hard for Americans to imagine how evil people are who are doing this. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm a parent looking for the murder of my son. And you have to be a moron to think that 19 Arabs did it. Again, my dogs know better than that. So that's very important. Put yourself in my shoes and think of your child being murdered. And you've never had an investigation. Well, how would you feel if they refused to investigate the murder of your child? I was at home until three in the morning. Then I got up because I couldn't sleep. I went back there, down there, to try to find someone. Could a fireman or a policeman still be trapped down there? I wanted to find him, even if he was... or a person who worked there, only to give myself a bit of satisfaction. I was down there searching for nine days, but I didn't find anyone alive. I went down there for nearly a year and a half. And if I wasn't down there working and searching, I was at funerals. They took my friends from me. They took my job from me. And I really loved that job. And they took my health from me. I do not want people to forget that day. And the story has to be told. 
problem with Americans, it's like a big iceberg. We live at the tip of the iceberg, and we're afraid of the dark truths of our history, and it's getting worse and worse. Well, this is a real dark truth. It will pull the whole iceberg down, but then hopefully it'll rise back up. But we have to learn the truth, or this country isn't worth anything. All that history is lame, and the people should be ashamed of themselves for not seeking the truth.